gathered on the grounds of Mu Yang Sa Temple in Palolo Valley, Oahu, to imagine a global, non-killing society. University of Hawaii political scientist Dr. Glenn D. Page, author of A Global Non-Killing Political Science, gathered guests from over 40 countries for consultation of this great idea. God of life, we have come from many different parts of this earth. We thank you for bringing us here safely together. Now in this historic moment, as we really discuss the essence of what a non-killing society means, we ask that the spirits bring us wisdom, bring us courage, and bring us hope. We thank you for the rains that came this morning that cleansed the land and cleansed our hearts. We thank you for the sun that rose from the east that brought light and hopefulness. Now we come together, we thank all those who have worked so hard, so diligently over the years and months, who have stood firm in the belief that a non-killing world is possible. Now, as we are gathered here, be with all those around this circle and all those that could not be killed. Oh, the spirits of the wind, spirits of the land, we ask that everyone here and all those who will benefit from all that has transpired here, all those people living on this planet, will really realize and work towards a world in which no one has to die, where life is encouraged, creativity blossoms, all for the children of the world, that a culture of peace and nonviolence may prevail. These things we breathe life. Eh, oh my, eh, oh my, eh, oh my. Give us love, give us hope, peace, and joy. Breath is life, water is life, food is life, but ahimsa is life for excellence. Without that, in the absence of ahimsa, all of them would become defunct. The value of life embedded in ahimsa has not been properly evaluated and that's why human life is really under the onslaught of killing, crime and corruption. By presenting the innovative concept of non-killing global political science, Professor Glandy Peach has drawn the attention of the whole world towards the fact that in the absence of ahimsa, it would not be possible for us to make the individual, the society, the nation, or the world free from killing, crime, and corruption. We find that the devils of hunger and poverty are spreading their tentacles worldwide because the consciousness of ahimsa is not awakened. The consciousness of compassion and sensitiveness is not developed. Unfortunately, the wrong notion of lopsided development has become deep-rooted in the world. Consequently, there is hardly any development of moral values in the life. There is hardly any development of spiritual values in the life. The problem relating to the de economic development is that despite is increasing, a particular class of the society is prospering, giving rise to millions of millionaires and billionaires but other section of the society is reeling under the tragedy of poverty and suffering from the pangs of the hunger. In order to solve the problem of the violence, we need to take the theoretical lessons as well as the practical exercises. That's why His Holiness Acharya Tulasi and Acharya Mahaprabhya has started a program of training in nonviolence, which trains 
a person to understand the theory and history of nonviolence, to change their heart by the effective strategies, to have the implication of nonviolent lifestyle, and also to train people to understand the purity in the means of livelihood and training self-employment techniques in order to overcome the poverty. I hope that the Global Forum would emerge as the prime center where the training in the nonviolence will be imparted to realize the dream where everybody can live peacefully, with happiness, and having a lot more harmony towards each other. Many, many thanks and best wishes from my heart and I feel that this forum will come up with some practical implications which will show and lighten the whole world, getting more peace and happiness. So this is the message from a living embodiment of nonviolence and peace, a symbolism of spirituality, an outstanding philosopher of Jainism, which is right now going through in India, taking care of Ahimsa Yatra, a peace march. So heartful blessings for this forum, and thank you so much. Nuriang Sahib Temple, our marvelous host. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's my boy, Temple Sahib Temple. Diego, without a complication, really thank you for being with me. It's really great, great honor to have the other guests from our country. I know it's uh, our uh, type of facility is not good enough for um, this kind of conference. I am sorry, very convenient. If we become to like your book, more 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 things. And uh, I could be just to me just to uh, explain where we are. We are now uh, the Buddha's of preaching. Here, there is a very dusty horizontal guardians all over. There are the three main uh, the, the stage here in front of art is a threefold body of the Buddha. A say, the center, center figure is called at the, the soul or the spirit of the Buddha. Then, right from the center is the that we say the enjoyment of the body, enjoy, enjoyment of the body of the Sakamani Buddha. Sakamani Buddha hasn't become Buddha in one life. It breaks the many, many lives. So it's a symbol of the uh, truth or result of the practice of the very life. And then the left side of the statue is uh, embodiment of the Shabbat Buddha, historical embodiment of Shabbat Buddha. So that's the purpose of the figures. In the back, we call it the Tanka or the Pema. This influence by the Tibet, the Angola, and the Buddha. It's also the people can see the last figure and also any of the Bodhisattva state. Also the ten most important student of the Shakamani Buddha, also some gardens. Also here two domains. They keep the Buddhism, Buddhist. Yeah, they are on the plate of it. Yes, they are looking so curious about the They protect you, not just how many of you. And also here many, many the Buddha, small Buddhas around the world here. Uh, there are 3,000 Buddha statues there. Uh, there are 3,000 Buddhas in the Mahayana Buddhism. 1,000 Buddha in Hest Karpa and 1,000 Buddha in Present Karpa, also another 1,000 in the Pius Karpa. Karpa is that uh, Indian terms, uh, Sri Lanka Sanskrit terms which is a long period of time. Uh, from the creation to the destruction of the universe, so each cup has appears uh, out of it. That means that uh, everybody becomes Buddha by practice. Everybody has a Buddha's nature. So each member says their own the Buddha. 
historical pagod ang may practice. Practice na ba ng kili, ng stili, ng may mag-tagalagin ng session. I'd like to finish a short story. When I was in the army so not a long time ago, my best test is if I practice on the unkiri commitment way. So I asked her that I'm doing very well that if I unkiri the mosquito or cockroach. And my best test is basically just asking me, oh yeah? But uh, you just, uh, I saw that uh, yesterday night in the kitchen you argued uh, that uh, your brothers. Yeah, I did. Actually, I don't like that brother because he gave a uh, very hard time of time. But unfortunately, he got a really stronger than me. I couldn't do anything for him. And my best asked me, you say you don't kill that uh, mosquito I brought you, but uh, if you had a love, how a love? You're gonna kill that your brothers. It's true. My best asking me, even you say you don't kill that mosquito, but you kill men. You kill your Buddha, your Buddha, Buddha nature. Where is your Buddha? Buddha's mind, show me. So I will answer to my best question. Uh, we have the first goal of my kid leadership program today. And, and I hope I can learn uh, I'm killing my Buddha, my Buddha through the Eastern Conference. And uh, everybody has the Buddha nature. We shouldn't kill our Buddha Buddha nature. Children's Buddha, Army's Buddha, Sebegian's Buddha. We should keep, we should practice policy on our death. Buddha. Well, I'm really, thank you again for coming visiting at my temple. Yeah, I really appreciate Dr. Peiji who made us a wonderful conference here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brothers and sisters, it's a great privilege to be here, to be asked to co-chair this meeting with the Nobel Peace Laureate Great. Uh, I've been corresponding for a long, long, long time and glad to see her and be sitting together with her here. Um, and this is a really groundbreaking forum on non-killing leadership, first one, and we hope that you have many more like this. Uh, the program that Professor Page has sent us highlights the following objectives of the forum. Now let me reiterate for all of us. These are one, convene and establish relationships among pioneering contributors to the non-killing world. world. Two, demonstrate spiritual, scientific, artistic, and practical grounds for confidence in human capabilities to realize a killing-free, open-ended world. Three, share translation and other activities in globalizing understanding of non-killing human capabilities. Four, Review lessons from non-violent, non-killing leadership experiences to advise on creating a global non-killing leadership academy. And five, and advise on creating a small center for global non-killing to serve as facilitator. And six, prepare a brief concluding statement to the global public to communicate participant judgment on the significance of the forum. As a political scientist, and myself, I see the essence of this form in the second objective, which states to demonstrate spiritual, scientific, artistic, and practical grounds for confidence in human capabilities to realize a killing free, open ended world that is, a world in which human beings do not kill each other and where social conditions are open to infinite human creativity. So, once we come to grips with that, my views, other group conference goals will you know, flow from that. Non-killing is a profound life affirming term which blends, which is Glenn's unique gift to all of us. Uh, it defines for us the kind of peace we are seeking. When I'm talking to strangers these days, uh, I often find myself saying that 
It is non-killing peace I'm speaking about. I'm very specific about that. It's non-killing peace I'm spe speaking about. And implicit in that statement is what kind of peace you are talking about. So uh, that is the question. This fundamental inquiry is helpful. As we know, peace in many quarters, though spelled in the same way, is defined as peace through military progress with collateral damage considered as inevitable and natural. So non-killing peace, as mentioned in this forum's second objective, is a composite that comprises spirit, science, skills, and service. Such composite helps us to work towards genuine democratic institutions and empowered citizenship for social and political transformation. The non-killing concept, unlike ahimsa and non-violence from which it evolved, is open-ended and measurable. I once heard Professor Johann Dalton say, peace is transcendental. And he was not saying this in any spiritual sense. Those of us who are in the peace world cannot afford to see others as an enemy or even different. If we did that, we would not be able to do our work. To bring all parties in conflict to the same table is to assert our common humanity. Any genuine vision of non-killing has therefore to transcend national boundaries. In Glenn Gates' work, that is a world in which human beings do not kill each other and where social conditions are open to infinite human creativity. One of the key issues of, 20th, of the 20th and now 21st century has been that of killing-prone leaders, supported by killing-prone populists, instead of promoting our common humanity, have contributed to build a sense of otherness. In non-killing peace building, our focus has to be on overcoming that otherness, valuing our extensive similarities while celebrating our differences. Good news is that during the unprecedented expansion of lethal approach to politics over the past century, there has been equally an upsurge in non-killing leadership. Glenn, in his book, Non-Killing Global Political Science, mentions a biographical dictionary of modern peace leaders. Uh, this was the 1985 biography was written and it records the lives of 717 such persons in 39 countries who lived from 1800 to 1980. So it's possible. Since then, there has been extension to this legacy of courage and commitment through numerous peace organizations and champions who have dedicated their lives to resolving domestic and international conflicts through nonviolent peace. A glimpse of such talent can be seen in the long list of nominees and recipients of Nobel Peace Prize. Your work by itself has shown in various ways, all of yours, I mean, we have read your bios, and so they are so impressive. Your work shows in various ways what could be accomplished in bringing nonviolent transformation. So, as Glenn has pointed out, the peace advocates in the last two centuries have been absolutely correct in stating that at some point we must simply refuse to kill and refuse to cooperate with systems that kill. Otherwise, cycles of lethality between vengeful, vanquished, and traumatized will continue. In retrospect, an analysis of 20th century atrocities shows a clear connection among the atrocities of World War I, World War II, and to the Cold War and beyond. So we therefore have to redefine the concept of political leadership from that of lethal commander to facilitator of non-killing societal problem solving, working on the root causes of the problems root causes of the problem. That's where we miss out. Now, this forum is unique in that instead of narrowing, narrowing down and non-killing to just state actors, we are looking at, non, at the non-killing's broadest application from a universal culture of peace to developing institutions and networks that would have non-killing groundings. The forum, in that sense, is not the customary problem-solving solution type but about awareness raising and confidence building, leadership learning. So we think that this momentum will lead towards effective training and new institutions to make a contribution from a non-killing perspective. And in that, as the, our Buddhist uh, host, Bob said, everybody can practice by becoming Buddha. You know, so it's not difficult. As coaches, uh, Mairead and I, at the closing session of the forum, hope to have for you a concluding statement from you here, along with summary reports from each rapporteur. And these can point ways of empowerment for both these already engaged in nonviolent peace building and those who are ready to join us on this path at local, national, 
and global levels. I hope that this dialogue over the next few days will help us in accomplishing that. Thank you. And our topic um, uh, on the Forum for Global Non-Killing Leadership is very appropriate. Um, the world needs hope. More than anything, people around the world need hope. There is a sense of powerlessness by many people that somehow their voice is not important that somehow they can't make a difference. There's a mass movement around our world of people who believe in non-killing and in non-violence. That movement of human rights, women's movement, being movements, is enormous. It is a great power in the world. And it is changing the world. And I feel that as the voice of that movement comes to the surface, then political leaders will have a duty and a responsibility to respond to the requests of the people's movement. Non-killing is something that has come uh, very necessary for our world today. For those of us who come into a non-killing conviction, we know that in conscience it is wrong to kill or to hurt. And as long as we clarify our conscience, that is very clear. So we believe in non-killing because it is the right thing to do. But non-killing is necessary for the world today because we are in a dangerous situation where if we continue on the road of militarism and war, we will destroy Mother Earth. So we have no alternative if we are realists and have them to look for an alternative way. So this conference is important because when we talk about non-killing, we have to recognize people are afraid. Fear will be the greatest enemy to us building a non-killing world. But we have to learn how to overcome our fear and act out of courage. So how do we, how do we learn to overcome our fear? That is a big question. But we are in a world today where the alternative must be found, the alternative institutions must be built. In the last century, we put our energy into technology. We operated out of mind. We brought the science to our world. And we built beautiful things, but we never brought the heart or the wisdom to ask, are these beautiful things going to enhance human life? Are they going to destroy human life? So we need to balance the head and the heart in order to come up with wise, answers. The convergence of the scientists and the religions beginning to work together in respect for each other will help us build a non-killing society. Because people are essential spiritual people. We are born to love and we love. We are people of the spirit and the heart must be brought into our decisions. So as we come together to listen to each other, to learn from each other, to share our experiences, we will come up with new ways for that. We are moving now into the next the session on the global non-killing spirit. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Lauren Gonson and the Reverend Kelo Patterson to speak to us of the spirit of non-killing in the Hawaiian tradition. Thank you very much. And aloha everybody. Um, unfortunately, Reverend Dr. Claire Patterson could not be here, but um, I am here and want to share with you the Hawaiian spirituality of non-killing. 
So when we say non-killing, right, that means we're alive. If we're alive, then that means we have breath. This breath of God that's in us. Now that is ha. Now everybody, just take a deep breath. Put your hand in front of you and say the word ha. Ha. You can feel that breath coming out of you. Feel that? Now, that is the physical manifestation of the spirit. This non-killing spirit. This life. This hope that Marie has talked about. That is at the essence of non-killing. That is the essence of Hawaiian spirituality, this breath. Now, as I look around this room, I can feel the life and breath of many of our brothers and sisters. We have traveled together across the plains. We have been in Ireland, India, Jordan, Colombia, in Atlanta, Georgia. We have been in the Philippines. I've been in India, all around this planet. For the first time, we are all gathered here together, here in the Bible. Being here is very special, because as you can see, it's a very beautiful place. But as you also know, this is the most isolated place on this planet. Your bodies, being on that airplane for so long really realizes how far away everything is. But at the center of this place where creation is taking place, where new life is happening in the land, on the big island of Hawaii, as the volcano has been going on for many years, almost about 20 years, land gives life and new land is being formed. So as we stand here understanding that everything is sacred everything has life the land which we walk on the wind that blows the water that we see and maybe some of us will have the opportunity to swim in so this breath that we shared and as we began with the point this morning we shared that breath sharing of that breath it's the sharing of the life. That is the sharing of the Spirit of God. That is linking us one with the other. Now, in Ha, in the word Aloha, have the breath. And Aloha, it's really peace. Okay, you'll be hearing that in many different contexts, but I want you to understand it as peace and hope. A, that stands for is really the, the stick that holds up. It's a little stick that, you know, in many countries, you carry water or you carry goods. Okay, that amo, that stick, is really the burden and responsibility that we carry on our shoulders. And L is really for the yearning for justice and peace. L is the lia, which justice and peace. H is really for the braiding. Um, that's for us to bring together all the people and the communities of our global society. That's what we're doing today. And the A is for the Alu, which really is about cooperation and reconciliation. And this helps us to understand. And then, um, moving quickly, the other element is Pule. The, uh, which is prayer. And to spell that, it's P, which really is kupukahi, which is peace that we find in ourselves and in all things. You is the upu, which is a never-ending hope, never giving up. And then L is the lani, the expanse of the skies under which we find strength and wisdom. And finally, E, is the ale, the wisdom and hope for a culture of peace and nonviolence for the children of the world. And so through the ha, the breath of life, and through aloha, 
which is peace and hope, and the power of Kule, lies the essence of my spirituality of Nanki. I feel very fortunate to be in this spiritual environment. There are thousands of Buddhas overlooking us, reminding us that there is an opportunity for every human being to awaken, to awaken to the fullest, to awaken to being a part of the entire universe. If I am a part of the universe, and the universe is the part of me, there is no place for violence. So nothing in society is possible. And for the Gente and Glenda and the colleagues have worked very hard to bring us here. So let us make this first non clean leadership society something that will in inspire not millions, but all six billion people in our world join together to build a non killing society. In Sri Lanka, in the South of the movement, we are following that spirit that again has imparted to us. Please go. Thank you. St. Patrick, who came to Ireland in the century, and Patrick's writings and he said very clearly, in Christ there is no healing. There is a great tradition in the Christian Church of non-killing and non-violence. Sadly, I feel that that tradition has not been taught. When I grew up in Belfast, I grew up in a Catholic family. My mother and father had been children, and we were family of uh, in fear. I remember um, my father and mother and their model of prayer and service to others. However, in my practicing of my faith, I never really thought very deeply about the whole concept of non-killing and peace. I found myself in the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland and witnessing the injustice in my community against the community by the state authorities. I felt very confused and asked the question, when faced with injustice, do you ever use violence? I thought very seriously of using violence to try to right the injustice that was being perpetrated against the community. I knew that there was a writing called the Just War Theory, and I went off to try to understand what this actually meant. I read the necessary qualifications of the Just War, and to me, it just didn't make sense. So I went seeking the message in the Gospels. I found there the beautiful message of non-violence. I remember very well being before a cross for long hours, trying to understand what the Christian message was all about. I thought it very clearly of your enemy and do not kill. At that stage, I came into non-violence, but it's not really. The word was unknown to me. And so I began to read deeper. I found non-violence in the scriptures. I found non-violence in the Sermon of the Mount. But above all, I found non-violence in the life of Jesus. You know, and I agree with that great, great, American theologian, Father John M. McKenzie, who says, you cannot read the Christian scriptures and not know that Jesus was totally non-violent. 
I think that is sad for the first 300 years of the Christians. We were indeed non-violent. The early writer said, I cannot be a soldier. I am a follower of Christ. Tragically, that beautiful non-violent message was lost as Christianity became one of the bloodiest crusaders throughout history. For this, I'm sorry. I ask the forgiveness of all those who have been murdered at the hands of Christians. I believe we now, as a Christian community, must reaffirm our utter commitment to non-violence and non-killing and play our part alongside of all our other brothers and sisters of different faiths and those who do not profess faith because the Spirit of God lives in every one of us. And I hope that we can join together now, play our part in the little world of non-killing and non-violence for the whole family and the world. The non-violence and non-killing has been a salient feature in the history of Indian people for more than uh, 2,500 years. For thousands of years, Ahimsa has been a starting doctrine of, for sages who strove to practice dharma, whether performing their worldly or spiritual duties. From uh, ancient Vedic period to the era of Mahatma Gandhi, the concept of Ahimsa has been a significant human value of Indian culture. The first written reference to Ahimsa is in Upanishads, uh, about 700 BC. It appears as one of the five ethical qualities that one must develop as personal sacrifice to discover the divine within. Ahimsa is one of the five ethical qualities along with truth, satya, righteousness, dharma, love, prema, and peace, shanti. Hinduism doesn't profess or assert its claim of truth in ways that would legitimate the use of violence to enforce these or punish those who do not profess its worldview. It is a religion that seeks achievement of peace through unity between material and spiritual, interior and exterior, Atma and Brahma. The all-pervasive reality when spoken in terms of its universal aspect is called Brahman and when as our innermost self is called Atma. This emergence of two brings the salvation, the moksha. The obstacles to such a spiritual union are acts of violence and untruth that are motivated by greed, anger, and self-interest. If these are not overcome, they continue to bring pain and ignorance. Patanjali in his Yoga Sutra says that when a man becomes steadfast in his abstentions from harming others, then all living creatures cease to feel enmity in his presence as there is no reciprocation. So the doctrine of Ahimsa in Hinduism is thus neither negative nor positive. The emphasis on is on action. Only the right means can achieve right ends. Definition of courage in Hinduism comes from the conception of death. That is living your life in a moment. If you live your life in each moment, fulfilling your dharma, your duties, as it could be your last, then, you're, then, you, fear, then you would fear nothing. Gandhiji's expression that non-violence is not for cowards was perhaps based on this implicit understanding of Ahimsa as he continued his experiments with truth. His, achieve, his active non-violent resistance emanated from such inner strength to confront the batons, the bamboo rods, and the bullets fearlessly, thus arousing a non-violent revolution in the conscience of the adversary. The Hindu scripture, Bhagavad Gita, is often described as treatise about war. In fact, it is more about ways to prevent a war, telling its readers how to overcome inner and outer conflict through fulfillment of righteous conduct. The ultimate vic victory in the Bhagavad Gita is not a happy one. It shows that as aftermath of a war, even the victors are not contented. The winning clan ultimately in a drunken brawl and highlights each other. Those who survive, mainly the four virtuous brothers on the hearing of this news and the demise of their mentor Krishna, renounce everything to follow the eldest, the journey north, till one by one they die walking towards Himalaya for their spiritual salvation. It was in this context, Gandhiji said, that 
violence may seem to resolve conflicts, but when it does, it is only temporary. And ultimately, in killing, no one wins because the winner leaves behind a bitter enemy. Violence may end all conflicts, but only after eliminating all humanity. To seek peace outside, one has to have peace within. At the same time, to be at peace internally, one has to play one's part in creating conditions of peace in the world. The two are intertwined. So in summary, the basic theological message of Hinduism stands out as one of unity of existence. It is fundamental in the Hindu search for love, truth, peace, and nonviolence. Killing is an extreme form that results from the sense of otherness we tend to create. Vision of Ahimsa is based on interdependence and inter interconnection among all beings and even non-beings. Ahimsa, non-violence, and non-killing affirm the neg negation of otherness to ensure that one is not causing the other any injury in thought, world, and deed. All Hindu prayers end with the benediction of Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, which means peace to, to body, peace to mind, and peace to soul that I am. Thank you. It, it would seem at first glance that there is an obvious common sense reason why non-killing and humanism are closely alike. And I may stop right there because I'm sure that all of you can see the inference in that, but, uh, or the implication in that. And you can draw your own inference, but I'll go on anyway. Humanism means assigning the highest value to live human beings. Observation and respect for the natural world, memory, reason, imagination, blank speaking, high thinking, goodwill, tolerance, and judgment are the instruments of humanism. Time and space, the vehicle of nature, the whole of nature, comprise both the palette and the canvas of humanism. To the humanist, each human should be protected at birth, nurtured in the natural world during youth, encouraged during times of creativity, and prolonged with uh, into mature pro productivity until peaceful and dignified death. Killing humans, shortening their, their mortal span through violence or neglect, is antithetical to valuing them. To humanists, pain and suffering, lying and superstition are the main bad things and are the cause of consequence of killing. The Kantian categorical imperative is actually that it be willed universally, or its musical counterpart, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, are better suited to non-killing than killing. The antithesis of, human, the antithesis of humanism is epitomized in St. Anselm's 12th century formulation called the ontological argument for the existence of God. Anselm thought that in the hierarchy of reality, a God is at the top and is therefore omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Such delegation of absolute power to something unseen is the very opposite of the humanistic sense of ethical responsibility for life. Such a blind mouth of absolutism contrasts sharply with the humanistic ontology of becoming. Humanism is subject to much subclassification and diverse morphologies. Classification is the ancient genius of Aristotle and the contemporary genius of the Google Wiz Wiz Kids, Page and Brin, the Palo Alto billionaires. Some varieties of humanism are secular humanism, Christian humanism, scientific humanism, geographical humanism, eye-level humanism, resource humanism, literary humanism, humanism of the arts, Asian humanism, Buddhist humanism, and even Confucian views of humanism, and I probably left out a whole bunch of them. Erasmus, a Christian humanist in the 15th century, showed and implied that the defining characteristic of humanism is ethics, social or personal. Humanistic ethics uh, applies principles to experience Ethics is not moralizing, although moralizing may be part of ethics. Humanism recognized that fraud is the handmaid of killing. Practical ethics is the ability to distinguish the is from the ought. Humanistic ethics is naturalistic and derives its enforcement from a broad understanding of consequences. To the humanist, ought is simply today catching up with tomorrow. The distinction between is and ought got an undeserved bad name from Machiavelli, but was rescued in the 20th century. It has become central to humanistic ethical thinking because it distinguishes but does, does not divide fact from value. It is particularly pertinent to the ethics of non-killing because living through 
our mortality is a big is, while thwarting mortality's devaluation is a big off. In short, non-filling ethics depends on the idea that what we perceive and what our human limitations let us conceive is what we've got. And enforcement is through the imperative of actively allevi alleviating pain, suffering, fraud, and superstition so that we can live with the consequences. The big leadership issue is not how, how to define and understand the ethical locus of humanism, but how to make ethical non-killing arguments persuasive to the point of action by one person or by six billion. So that people choose to act as non-killers rather than killers. Again, diminishing pain, suffering, and lying by vigorously estimating naturalistic consequences is at the core of humanistic action. Two traditional aspects of humanism could be re-energized as part of a worldwide effort at leadership to stop killing. Leadership in non-killing humanistic ethics could connect rule ethics and attitude ethics. Uh, for example, a rule ethic such as thou shalt not kill and an attitude ethic of the waste of life by killing impulse me needs to be integrated and need to be integrated into ethical social contracts. This merging could be done through approaching the problem through conventional, widely understood institutions, namely art, particularly architecture, and education, which are really loci of agreement. Even our best and brightest turn out to be purveyors of killing because they corrupt these two good institutions through the artful rhetoric of lying propaganda and the destructive education of self-interest. An epitome of humanistic art was Marian Anderson singing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939. That political high art was a symbolic beacon leading to a distant non-killing shore. In the spirit of secular humanism, which is always in process and greets with the loa, many other compatible ways of understanding and action, this form may want to show the path of non-killing cultural leadership to the redirection of education and the indirection of art. Thank you. The humanist made to the non-killing debate uh, about how to make ethical non-killing arguments pers persuasive to the point of action. That's a very, very important aspect. Thank you very much. Hello to all non-killing thinkers, speakers, and makers. We are not just thinkers, not just speakers, but we are the makers of non-killing. And we are makers, and thus we have a hope, faith, that we can change the world, we can make the world more better. We all have been in a process of creation, creating this world, and we all aim at the same goal, a peaceful world. As God Mahavi has said, that we are all equal, we are all respectable. He just said that not just humans, but the animals, the plants, the earth has life, the water has life, the fire has life. Respect them. When we just see the whole perspective of life in all the beings here, earth has life, how can we kill it? If it, if it is equal to me, how can I destroy it? So this concept of non-killing has a very positive energy in it to keep ourselves peaceful. You've been dealing with this non-killing in the sense that don't kill is a positive definition of non-killing, which is love, respect, and live happily with each other. And I'm seeing a sign there that says the time is spending by, passing by, our time is running. And in this running time, we are all each moment creating something of ourselves. Each action of us is creating something. And God Mahavi says, it does not a cause, it is not our words, but our action makes the world. If we do something non-violent, if we do something for non-killing, that will make the world. We have been thinking here when we, we are getting so many good ideas and views about the world, but we really need to work for it. And how could we work for it? Where we need to work for it? And the simple thing is, 
search the cause of violence. Search the cause of our unsuccess if it is there. What's the cause? We have to. There are two things which we are generally dealing with. One is prevention, the other is cure. We are trying to cure the disease, but we need to even prevent that. Take measures to prevent it. And if we deal with the preventive measures of nonviolence, we would be much more productive. And the preventive measure is training in nonviolence. We need to train ourselves. We need to train our students. We need to train our next generation to lead a peaceful world, to lead a peaceful life. I'm a teacher, a professor. I'm teaching their meditation and spiritual development. And we do small experiments. I'll share you with one of them. Once I ask the students, OK, we'll try one thing. When we see a red light, we get angry. We just feel bad. But let us do one thing. Whenever we see a red light, try to ask ourselves to relax. So the simple thing to come out of stress. Because violence is not just on others. Violence is on the self. We are killing ourselves by the stress. And Lord Mahavira said that killing anyone else would first be killing yourself. So we are trying to kill ourselves by either killing others or being stressful on us. And the students were really productive. They said first day it was really difficult. But second and the third day it became easy. We need to give them new techniques, new ways, teach them how we can apply the practical way of tolerance, apply practical way, how can we be more practical in nonviolence? So practical technique should be developed and that would really create a better world. So let us start a change from the individual level. Change from the self and then because a society, a world is formed from each individual and if you don't change the individuals, the world shall never change. Let us make a point that we come up with new strategies, new practical experiences, new practical experiment, experiments which can help us, teach us or learn, uh, let the world learn about it and make a better world. Thank you. Sister, and thank you for reminding us that not only the humans have life, life is all around us and remind us about the animals we need to take care of as well. And, uh, your phrase, we're killing ourselves with stress. <laughs> so very important lessons that we need to take on board. Thank you, Sister. Um, we ask now Dr. Safa Anandan to speak to us on non-killing spirit within the Islam. Uh, there are many ways to talk about Islam and non-killing uh, from a spiritual side. What I want to do right now is to talk to you about ants, birds, infants, and saving human lives. Ants. Allah's apostle said, once while a prophet amongst the prophets was taking a rest underneath a tree, an ant bit him. He therefore ordered that his luggage be taken away from underneath the tree, and then ordered that the dwelling place of the ants should be set on fire. God then sent him a revelation. Wouldn't it have been sufficient to burn a single ant that bit you? This is from Hadith al-Bukhari Abu Hurairah narrated. Birds. We were with the Apostle of Allah, peace be upon him, during a journey. He went to ease himself. His, we saw a bird with her two young ones, and we captured her young ones. The bird came and began to spread its wings. The Apostle of God came and said, Who grieved this for its young ones? Return its young ones to it. He also saw an ant village that we had burned. He asked, who has burned this? We replied, we did it. He then said, it is not proper to punish with fire, except the Lord of fire. Hadith Abu Dawood narrated by Abdullah ibn Masood. Infants. The Quran said, when news is brought to one of them of the birth of a female shy, his face darkens and he is filled with inward grief. With shame does he hide himself from his people because of the bad news he has had. Shall he retain it on sufferance and contempt or bury it in the dust? Ah, what an evil choice they decide on. This is Surah 16, Ayah 58 and 59. Then um, Surah 17, Ayah 31, God said, Kill not your children for fear of want, 
we shall provide sustenance for them as well as for you. Verily, the killing of them is a great sin. Saving human lives. Al-Quran, Surah Al-Maidah. On that account, we ordain that the children of Israel, that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Then although there came to them our apostles with clear signs, yet even after that many of them continue to commit excess in the land. Now what does these four teachings do to non-killing politics understood as architectonic science in the sense of Aristotle? First, I think there are four lessons. Overkill is wrong. It is the question of proportionality that Marit was talking about when she referred to the notion of just war. Two, when you talk about young ones, what does that mean? It means you cannot kill the future. It is the obligation to protect the future. Three, when you talk about infanticide that has been practiced, what does it mean? It means you cannot kill in the name of culture. You have to protect the weakest link. Four, when you say saving one life is saving the whole of human life, what does it mean? It means you cannot kill using the notion to justify ends to justify means with the ends through the number, which means the notion of quantity as a justifying mechanics does not work, which means you cannot justify the world using the utilitarian principle in the name of killing. Taking these together, you know, in terms of proportionality, in terms of the future, in terms of culture, in terms of utilitar utilitarian notion, what does it mean? It means that non-killing is not only possible, it is an imperative for the world God creates with mercy. Wabillahi tawfiq wal hidayah. Salam Thank you, Jared. That's a very uh, original contribution. I have not heard such an exposition on from bringing the ants and birds and infants and saving human life together.